So as everybody can tell, I am in Washington, D.C. right now and not New York. I'm in Washington, D.C. because I'm effectively stuck in Washington, D.C. because uh, I'm fundamentally incapable of driving. Now, the reason for that is I, um, at best, I tore a muscle in my, uh, in my calf and I can't really walk on my own. So I got these bad boys here. This is one crutch. I have two crutches here and um, hobbling around all over the place. And I want to tell you guys the story because I ended up in the emergency room and boy, oh boy, did I see some shit. And it really just highlights the horror of our healthcare system. Now, don't get it twisted. Uh, you know, I'm the one who constantly talks about the data and the evidence and, you know, the information about how our system is broken. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the number one proponent of giving people the details of it from a macro perspective, not a micro perspective, not the anecdotes. But since I now have an anecdote, I may as well share it because the firsthand experience was obviously very eye-opening in a way that really brings to fruition and to light what those numbers actually mean. So um, I was playing tennis with Crystal and, uh, you know, I was running for a ball that was basically barely getting over the net and... It felt like somebody took a bat and just whapped the back of my calf pretty hard. Like a bat hit me in the back of the leg. So I felt it, and my first thought was like, well, obviously, I, I said, what hit me? I turned around and looked. I was like, what hit me? And in my mind, I went from like, I, I, I probably thought it was like, you know those tennis machines that like shoot the balls out really fast? And, you know, when, you're, when tennis pros are practicing, they use it. I thought maybe a machine like that or something shot a tennis ball into my leg, but I quickly turned around and realized, oh shit, nobody's there. Oh no, that was my calf. So it was like kind of a popping sound. And um, I knew immediately that I was in trouble because I couldn't put any weight on it at all. Any weight on it. It was just like, I just, I had one leg that just didn't work at all. Not even a little bit. Um, so, you know, I tried, I gave it 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, iced it. And had to determine, where are we at? How bad is this? And it was overwhelming in my head. I, I have no choice. I have to go to the hospital. And the reason I thought that was the case is because um, without having done any of the research yet, my thought was there's a chance I need surgery. And if I need surgery, obviously it needs to get addressed like quickly. So uh, went to a hospital in Virginia. And I'm not going to give the name because it's not even really about this particular hospital because you could replicate this throughout the country. And I, that's obvious because I most of you guys have horror stories about our healthcare system, and you've experienced it in various states throughout the country. So uh, first thing, I you know, I walk into the hospital <laughs> to the extent I can walk. I'm actually hobbling on something we were using as a cane. Um, and nobody really says anything to me. There's like a security person. There's people behind the desk. I'm hobbling in. Clearly, I can't really walk. Nobody really says anything to me. So then I start, I look, I see there's like this check-in thing, this kiosk. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm supposed to use this. So I start putting my information in. At the end of it, it says, oh, you're not in our records. So it, basically the whole check-in process was useless. Apparently that was for people who had already been there before. I didn't know that, okay? Mind you, I'm in excruciating pain and I'm trying to type shit into a kiosk. So then I, you know, I talk to the people behind the counter and um, the, they ask the basic question, name, date of birth, do you have your insurance, all that stuff. They give me a form to fill out, again, all the while in excruciating pain. Finally, after that, somebody's like, oh, do you want a wheelchair? Okay, well, this would have been helpful when I walked in the door like eight minutes ago. But I said to them, uh, no, but I would really, uh, if you could give me a crutch or crutches, that'd be really helpful. Cause, and my thinking was, I don't want to take a wheelchair from somebody who, like, really needs it. And I'm in a position where I could still get around on one, one leg, so I'll have crutches. And the person says, oh, you, we can't uh, do that. You have to wait until, you know, you're seen or something. I'm like, okay. Now, mind you, again, in excruciating pain, that's clear. At no point did anybody say, even up front, hey, do you need Advil? Do you need Tylenol? Do you need, uh, in all seriousness, they should have been like, you need Vicodin or Percocet or Codeine or some shit. Because... I'm in excruciating pain. I can't. One of my legs doesn't work at all, and it feels like it was just totally ripped apart. So, anyway, um, fill out the form, sit down, and wait. 
Um, maybe after three hours, two or three hours, I'm brought back, and they just go through, again, basic questions. Name, age, date of birth, very basic stuff. They take my vitals, okay? So, again, I get, there's a process, whatever. But there's, why, why are you taking my, my blood pressure when I'm here for a leg problem? Why are we doing this again? Okay, check the vitals. Fine. Uh, what's the issue? Explain what happened. Okay, cool. Then they put you back out there in the waiting room again, in the emergency room. Okay, so I went in for a second, came out. A couple hours more go by. I get brought in uh, t for an x-ray. Now, x-rays look at the bone. I was very clear from the beginning this is not a bone issue. My bone is fine. It's either it's a muscle or ligament, potentially ligament or tendon issue, but it's definitely not a bone issue. 100% not a bone issue. But they do an x-ray. Then they bring me back out, and I'm waiting for hours more. So after seven hours having been there, not eaten, nothing, uh, we decide this is this is useless. Like they're, they're not doing anything. Now, meanwhile, I was texting with my friend who is a doctor and he was explaining to me basically, you know, what the process would be. And he told me pretty much point blank, they're just going to send you off. They're just going to send you off. So what I needed was either an MRI or actually for what I have in particular, an ultrasound would have worked too. Um, and they needed to tell me like the extent of the damage. Um, and I didn't get an MRI. I didn't get uh, an ultrasound. I wasn't really told the extent of the damage. And this is all before, listen, I live in New York. I was in Virginia. My insurance probably isn't going to fucking cover this. So that whole experience, seven hours in a waiting room, I have nothing to show for it at all. So get out of there. Literally buy my own crutches. Now, thankfully, I have the means to do that. But what about somebody who doesn't? Buy my own crutches. Ice it, elevate it, compress it. Now, in the whole process of sitting in the emergency room, we were reading about, like, well, what actually is my injury? We're trying to fucking diagnose it ourselves. I don't have a medical degree, but this is what, this is what I felt like I had to do. So come to find out, you know, you read more about it. Um, it's called it, tennis leg is the term for it. How appropriate, right? Um, and basically, there's a muscle inside the calf that very rarely is it a full rupture oftentimes it tears like how bad the tear is it depends now i will eventually get an mri we tried to set that up and everything um should have it within this coming week but um the reason why we ultimately decided we can't wait any longer among many reasons is like it said very rarely do you need surgery and even if you get surgery it wouldn't be up front so we were like okay you know what we're gonna tap out but it was seven hours wasted with nothing to show for it. At the end of it, we had to do all the research on the phone, figure out ourselves what we think it is and what we think is likely, and then buy the stuff ourselves. Okay, crutches, ice, a compression thing, wrap. Now, I, so this is just the story so far as it pertains to, to me. I haven't even gotten to the juicy stuff yet because the juicy stuff is what happened, what I saw while I was there, which is, was such an eye-opening experience to witness all this firsthand. So I'll give you a few examples. So uh, I'm sit in the process of waiting and nothing happening because nothing happened the entire time that was actually serious in a helpful way. Um, somebody comes in. It's, uh, I would say she was about maybe 10 years old, 11 years old, 11 year old girl. Clearly her hand slash her fingers, maybe as well, were broken. And it looked to me like a compound fracture. Why? Because it was to totally limp. You know what I mean? Like, you could tell when it's a hairline versus a compound fracture because of how it's sitting. So he had some fingers that were pointing in the wrong direction. The hand totally limp. 10 or 11-year-old girl crying from the second she walks in. Walks in. Uh, name, date of birth. This is to the mother. Name, date of birth. Insurance. Here's a form. Her hand is hanging off. Her fingers are pointing in the wrong direction. She's crying relentlessly. She had to sit and wait. Now, and by the way, she was one of the lucky ones. But she had to wait about 15 minutes before she was seen by anybody. Okay, nope, still, I'm still not even close to done. 
oh, they, they're some incredible stories. Another one. So somebody gets wheeled out from behind the emergency So they were in a, a place in the emergency room, in a room, getting some sort of treatment. They get wheeled out. Dude very clearly just had blunt force trauma, maybe a car accident or something, had scars all around his head, blood on his clothes. He was stitched up. Dude is maybe 35% conscious, probably had a severe concussion, give, given the looks of it, what happened. And um, they just wheel him out from behind, park him in the waiting room, and let him know, like, hey, dude, bathroom's over there. And then they walk in and leave him there. And he was sitting there for, like, two hours, totally unattended to, semi-conscious, just got surgery, was all stitched up, blood everywhere, and alone. Alone. I got more. Another dude gets wheeled out. He was in a room, had, had just gotten some sort of, uh, you know, help. Come, they wheel him out, probably 45, 50-year-old guy, uh, shaking relentlessly, right? Holding one of the throw-up bags with throw-up in it that you could see. Um, seems like almost incapable of talking. Wheeled out, parked him in the emergency room, in waiting room, didn't say a word to him, walked away. He was left there for hours. Okay. Okay. Still haven't gotten to the most insane part. Some people were there from when I walked in till when I left. Now, remember, I didn't get anything that was really helpful, but they did take an x-ray, even though it was useless and I needed an MRI or, or um, an ultrasound. There were some people who were sitting there, didn't get help the entire time, and they were just sitting there. Okay. The most concerning one, Dude walks in with either his dad or his grandfather, and the guy's holding, uh, you know, one of the throw-up bins, and he's shaking. And guy brings him in. First words out of his mouth, he can't breathe. I don't know whether it was dad or his grandfather, but he's like, he can't breathe. He can't breathe. He's holding this thing, shaking, and he clearly is struggling to breathe. Um, name and uh, date of birth... Um, here's, here's a form to fill out. Have you been here before? He can't breathe. They just dry, just process here. They, and when he, like, hey, he can't breathe, they were like, we, we know, sir. I don't know if you guys hear that. There was like a doorbell or something. Anyway, he was like, we know, sir. And they made him sit down for like 10 or 15 minutes. It took a third time for dude to go up to say, he cannot breathe, for them to be like, oh, oh, okay, let's, let me, and then, you know, finally, the dude got help. Now, listen, I don't want to, like, I'm not putting it all on the individuals who were involved in this, because the fact of the matter is, probably because of COVID, they're totally stretched thin, the doctors are working, you know, way too many hours, everybody's tired, everybody's maxed out. There's just no beds left in the hospital. Like, I get it. There's all these problems. But here's my wacky solution. Fix it. Like, nobody's even fucking talking about this shit in any serious way. In any serious way. I haven't heard a politician, business person, anything. I haven't heard anybody say, you know what? We should probably increase the number of hospitals in this country by 40%. Which probably is the minimum of what is needed. Uh, we're going to crusade to increase the number of doctors in this country by 50%. I haven't heard anybody say anything like that at all. At all. No business person talks about it because why would they talk? They're printing money at these shitty facilities that already exist if it's a private hospital, right? So they're making a shitload of money and they don't care that the service is terrible. No politician is talking about it because we don't even have single payer health care in this country, even though we should. So here you have, like, I'm sitting there thinking, this is not like I'm in an industrialized country. This is not like I'm in a developed country. You had the entire room full of people. And by the way, there were a number of people who walked in where I'm looking at them like, if they call my name, I almost want to be like, D help this person first because they got it way worse than I do even though I can't fucking walk and one of my legs don't work. That's how bad it was. So my big takeaway, I know, radical, crazy. My big takeaway is we absolutely positively need to increase the number of hospitals in this country. We need to have, you know, we need to... Make it so that we increase the number of doctors and nurses by 40%, 50%, 60%. It's absolutely what's necessary. Now, th there's a flip side of this too, which is, for the love of God, if the hospitals are stressed because of 
COVID, everybody go get vaccinated. It reduces severe illness, hospitalization, and death by 90%. And the people who are mostly filling up the hospitals are people who haven't been vaccinated. So go get vaccinated, go get it right now. It's because of a lot of those people, keep it real, who now, dude who can't breathe has to wait 15 minutes. Poor girl whose hand is broken and fingers broken has to wait, you know, 15 minutes. You got people, they're going there. I mean, some people had a conversation with some people when we were there. Woman with a sick baby. She, she's like, I've been here since 6 a.m. Well, what time was it when that was said? Probably 8 o'clock at night. Somebody came in with a, a baby who was throwing up, not, not baby, like three, four-year-old, I think probably like three, who was throwing up every 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes. And I know they weren't bullshitting. I saw it. I saw it. They weren't getting help anywhere near quick enough. So they literally were like, should I, bring my, should I go to a different hospital? You guys seem like, you know, you're a little stretched thin here. Guys, it's, it's at the point where it's, it's almost game, set, match on the entire country, the way I look at it. I mean, I, I seriously, you know the point I'm at? You need to be on the verge of dying to even go to the hospital. Like, for what I had, now I look at it, I'm like, I was silly for even trying to fucking go. I was silly for even trying to go when my right leg doesn't even work and I thought I might need surgery. Well, I wasn't 100% convinced I need surgery, so it was a waste of time. Don't do it. And then I have any, uh, there, here's another whole angle to this conversation. They don't give out pain pills for Dickie McGee's acts anymore. For nothing. So, guys, I, I don't know how many times I can say it. I was in excruciating pain. My right leg doesn't work. I tore my calf. It's still possible I ruptured it. I, although I doubt it because my foot can move a little bit, but I just can't straighten my leg and I can't walk on it or put any weight on it. But the fact that my foot can move a little bit and I have a little bit of range of motion up and down with it, leaves me to believe it's not a rupture, it's probably a tear. But excruciating pain definitely could have used from right when I walked in. Okay, look, obviously give the guy some Vicodin or some shit. He needs it. They don't give it out for anything anymore. You want to know why? Because, of course, there was the issue where they were handing it out like, hotcakes to everybody, you had a headache or a backache, they just give you some oxy, then a bunch of people got hooked on oxy, and now, because we're a bunch of fucking idiots, the pendulum has swung way too far in the other direction, and now I can't get pain pills when I need pain pills. I talked to Lilith about this. Lilith had cracked ribs and couldn't fucking get pain pills. There are people who live in chronic pain now and can't get pain pills because some people abused it. What is it about us that makes it, we have, there's no nuance. Everything is black or white. There's no gray area. There's no, hey, these people appear to need the oxy and these people don't. No, none of that. None of that. It's just now it's like, you know, you're lucky if they give you Tylenol 3, which by the way, I didn't get that. I didn't get an ibuprofen. I didn't get an Aleve. I didn't get Tylenol. I didn't get Advil. I didn't get shit. I got a useless x-ray for a bone when I knew it wasn't a bone problem from second number one. And I was there seven hours and I'm nothing to show for it. And, and uh, by the way, again, New York insurance in Virginia, I'm probably going to get a bill of thousands of dollars when they did nothing but waste seven hours of my time. I feel terrible for how broken the system is and how many lives this negatively affects. Get fucking vaccinated because these hospitals are overburdened. I don't care what anybody says. They're overburdened, man. They're overburdened. And to the politicians out there, and anybody who gives a fuck, for the love of God, never stop advocating for Medicare for all. Never stop advocating for single payer. Never stop pushing the issue and talking about the problems. This is the realest I've ever seen in my life. Just a stark example in real life that matches up perfectly with what the data shows. And that shit was fucking eye-opening. Again, I've always told you guys about the data. I'm on top of that like nobody's business. But having the firsthand experience and witnessing just how bad it was, the way that process is put above everything else, you know, there's no humanity. There's no communication either. There's, there's an idea. How about every hospital has to have a communicator who can really clearly explain to everybody what's going on, how it's going to unfold? There was none of that. There was, it was just a bunch of miserable people in extreme pain not getting taken care of adequately at all. At all. Eye-opening experience. We need Medicare for all. We need it now. For the love of God, go get vaccinated because these hospitals are overburdened. And every, just advocate for Medicare for all. We need Medicare for all. We need to increase the number of hospitals by 40%, 50%. Same with the number of doctors. Same with the number of nurses. Because 
we are nowhere near an adequate system. And by, for everybody who brings, oh my God, the wait time in Canada or, or the single payer, it's always the single payer countries have wait times. Did you know that? You know, the average wait time in a hospital in the U.S. is an emergency room in the U.S. over four hours, four hours. And by the way, you'll go bankrupt too in the U.S. Medical bills are the top cause of bankruptcy in this country. I don't know how long the wait lines are there, but I know they, number one, prioritize by need. And number two, you're not going to go bankrupt if you have a medical issue there. Anyway, you could tell this fired me up. Um, the show will continue to be in D.C. instead of New York for an extended period of time now because I'm stuck in D.C. I can't drive. <laughs> I can't walk. I can't play tennis. I can't play golf. I can't play soccer. Uh, so I'm, I'm in D.C. now and I'll remain in D.C. for an extended period of time. The show schedule will continue to be a little bit wacky and it'll change a little bit from time to time because, um, you know, I just can't be on the same schedule. But we'll continue pumping out the same amount of content and I'm just hoping that <laughs> this thing heals itself or that I'll get some real answers very shortly about what the proper course and treatment is moving on. But anyway, there you have it. That was my nightmare story and... Man, was it an experience. Ever since Adpocalypse, when YouTube defunded all independent news and politics overnight, we haven't trusted them. We know they can pull the rug out from underneath us at any time. If you enjoy this content, please consider tipping a dollar or two per month on the Secular Talk Patreon. Link in the video description box below. Thanks for your support.